Welcome to our Sunday morning service from Nid Valley Methodist Circuit. I am Reverend Moses, one of the ministers at this circuit. If you are one of those who watches regularly this service, welcome back. I hope you are having a good summer. I hope you also had a, a good prayer week last week. But if you are new or stumbled upon this service today, special welcome. I hope you find this service a blessing and an encouragement for your journey of life and deepen your relationship with our Savior Jesus Christ. Later on in this service, Mo Onyet, who is the, a student minister, will be bringing God's word. Now I'm going to start this service with a passage from Psalm 100. It says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with thanksgiving. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen. We're now going to take an opportunity as a family to give thanks to God and to praise his name. Heavenly Father, we praise you for who you are and for what you've done. We love you, God, for who you are. You are the unchanging God. You hold the universe in your hands. You are a generous father. You are like the perfect mother and father, and you know all of our thoughts and needs. You are the light that shines in the darkness and gives me strength when I'm scared. You are a great big God, but small enough to be my friend. Thank you, God, for family and friends. Thank you, God, for our homes. Thank you, God, for flowers. And most of all, God, thank you that you died for us on the cross. God, we're sorry for the times that we do things wrong. Like when we're selfish or when we lie. And when we're angry and grumpy when we disobey or when we're unkind. But we thank you, God, that you promise that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just and you'll forgive us and you will forget. And now we join together to say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings Holy 
exclaiming Indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky And you know them by name You are amazing, God All-powerful, untamable All struck we fall to our knees As we humbly proclaim Told every lightning bolt where it should go Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow Who imagined the sun and give source to its light Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night can fathom indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing god all powerful untamable all struck we fall to our knees as we humbly The reading today is taken from Matthew 14, reading from verses 22 to 33, Jesus walks on water. Immediately after this, Jesus made his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. Afterwards, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble, far away from land, for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him, they screamed in terror, thinking he was a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. It's all right, he said. I am here. Don't be afraid. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you by walking on water. All right, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he looked around at the high waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Instantly, Jesus reached out his hand and grabbed him. You don't have much faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. Thanks be to God for his word. Whenever I've heard the story of Jesus walking on the water, it's always been treated as a standalone story, with Jesus' nighttime stroll as the most meaningful part. I've heard that story and wondered why it was so important for us to know that Jesus had that particular skill. It doesn't suggest anywhere else that he was in the habit of taking a nighttime stroll on the lake, so why now? 
Well, to even begin to answer that, I think it's really important that we hear about what happened just beforehand. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and John, this comes straight after the feeding of the 5,000. We know this is a significant story because it not only appears in three Gospels, but it follows the same order in the Gospel of John as it does in Matthew and Mark. And that's actually quite unusual because in the Gospel of John, things tend to be in a slightly different sequence. There are several things going on in this very short story. And I dare say that Jesus walking on the water is not the most significant. In fact, there's so much going on, it's quite tricky to cover it all. So I'd like to encourage you now, just for a moment, to imagine that you were one of Jesus' disciples in the story. It's been one heck of a day, and all you want to do now is rest. The day started after the dreadful news of the death of John the Baptist. Jesus took off by himself in a boat to go to a deserted place to pray. And you had to follow Jesus all the way out there on foot. And you'd walked for miles and when you got there you had to work hard managing the crowds and probably dealing with their questions about who Jesus is. You see, there were thousands more who followed him to that deserted place. And just when you thought you could rest, he made you stay and mingle with the crowds, feeding them all with the food he miraculously produced. And when he finally said you could go, you got into the boat feeling really tired. It's a long way a few miles to row to the other side of the lake. But you know, when you get to the other side, you can rest. Before long, though, you're faced with a strong, sudden, easterly wind. That's the thing about Lake Galilee. Sometimes even the fishermen can't see the bad weather coming. It becomes hard to row against the wind and the waves are getting higher. Out there for hours, trying without success to reach the other side of the lake, there comes a point when you're so tired that you can't quite tell reality from dreams. So when you see a figure walking towards you across the water in the darkness, you rub your eyes in disbelief when that figure keeps getting nearer to you, you begin to feel a bit frightened and a bit disorientated. A voice calls out to you, telling you not to be afraid. But you're so tired, you find it hard to recognise the voice. What would your reaction be? As much as I can usually identify with Peter's actions, I'm not sure that I would first of all dare to shout back with a challenge, if it's really you, Lord, call me to go out there with you. And secondly, while I like to give things a go, jumping out of a boat to try walking on stormy water in the middle of the night is not the first thing that would cross my mind. Going back to the question of what Jesus was doing there on the lake, Jesus had left his disciples to go and pray. His time alone with God was really important and it seems he didn't get much time to do that. Of course we don't know what the outcome was of Jesus' conflab with God up on the mountain, but I suspect it wasn't a direct order to go out and wander across the lake. I wonder if that was more out of compassion for the disciples than it was a deliberate miracle. We hear that Jesus had seen his disciples in trouble out on the lake. Perhaps he was moved with compassion to save them. 
We'd already heard that Jesus had compassion on the people who followed him to the deserted place. And that's where he fed them with that miraculous meal. Immediately after this, when they reach land, there are crowds bringing their sick to them, asking to be healed. And we hear that Jesus does just that. So maybe walking on the water was another demonstration of Jesus' humanity. As tired as they were, Peter just couldn't resist having a go, could he? Again, though, it seems he hasn't really thought about it because it's when he thinks about the situation that he panics and sinks in. Some people have said this is a really twee message about Jesus always being there to keep us safe in times of trouble. If only we focus on him and not what's going on around us. And then they say that Peter fell in, of course, because he wasn't focused enough on Jesus. I'm not sure that that version of things does justice to what's really going on. We're told Peter fell in when he saw the wind. Could he have been worried about his friends who were still in the boat and still at risk of danger from the conditions on the lake? In which case it's not so much about Peter's lack of faith in Jesus or his lack of focus, but it's his lack of confidence in his call. Why should he be able to walk to Jesus? leaving the others behind. Of course, perhaps Jesus was always going to save them. Thinking back to the feeding of the 5,000 again, the disciples had all questioned Jesus' instruction to feed the people, protesting they didn't have enough food. But Jesus persisted and they did feed the people and at that moment their calling was affirmed. When Jesus had saved Peter and got into the boat and the danger stopped, the disciples realised that Jesus really is the Son of God. His stroll on the lake had shown them his divine side. But it wasn't when they saw him walking across the lake that they believed he was divine. It was actually when he stopped the storm and saved them. So we've seen Jesus' humanity demonstrated in this story, in his concern for his friends. And we've also seen that he's divine because of his control over the elements. But why go out walking on the lake and not just stop the storm? Of course, I don't really know the answer to that, but perhaps it has something to do with showing us how to manage that delicate balance we tread as Christians, called by Christ to a life of faithful action while putting Jesus at the centre. We start our prayers today by thinking of others who are in worse positions than ourselves. People, for example, who are suffering in India and in refugee camps where coronavirus is on a steep increase and where poorer people find it hard to get care. For the people in hospitals suffering from any illness, especially those unable to see their loved ones. We pray for those who have worked throughout this time, many in difficult and vulnerable situations, and for those who, as a result of COVID, have found themselves redundant. Secondly, we pray for our world leaders, for Boris Johnson and Donald Trump and others in position of power. We pray that the decision makers will be motivated by kindness and love rather than financial gain and personal glory. We pray that they will not forget that other issues like climate change and the refugee crisis still need addressing, alongside that of economic stability amidst a global pandemic. Thirdly, we pray for those who feel they have been left on the margins of society and therefore fight to be represented positively by the media as they strive for social justice. We pray for ethnic minorities who have lived in the UK all their lives, but because of their race, continue to feel excluded and different. We also pray for refugees who have come to find safety, such as Hassan Akkad from Syria, 
who has worked long shifts on a minimal wage throughout the COVID-19 pandemic in a busy London hospital. Yet, he still cannot have access to free healthcare. We pray that our government will focus on working towards a society that works for all, rather than just a privileged few. Finally, we pray for families as they struggle to stay in touch safely, especially those with older or vulnerable relatives who haven't been able to hug since March. We think of young people as they cope with the effect COVID has had on their futures. Exams missed, job opportunities lost, university choices changed, and once in a lifetime travel chances removed. We thank you, Father God, for listening to these prayers and pray that you will help us find ways to move forward with positivity and love. Amen.
Now, may the Lord bless you and help you and give you strength to get out of the comfortable boat and to discover God-given potential and also to experience great and unsearchable things that you do not know. The blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Now go in peace and live and serve the Lord.